When I was six, Mao launched his great leap forward. Mao's dream after he took power in China was to turn the country into a military superpower so he could be the boss of the world. To fulfill this dream, Mao bought huge quantities of arms industries, um, and particularly um, the atomic bomb technology and equipment, and technology and equipment to, to make the missiles. But how was he going to pay for these extremely expensive purchases? Mao's answer was food. So he exported the food in huge quantities to Russia and some to Eastern Europe to pay for his military industries. And Mao knew his people were dependent on this food for survival. China was not able to introduce, uh, to, was not able to produce enough food to feed its population and had been a food importer for the last, for the past hundred years. And now suddenly all this food was going abroad. And Mao knew tens of millions of people would die of starvation. He said to his top echelon, educate the peasants to eat less. Having only tree leaves to eat, so what? And he said that for all his projects to take off, half of China may well have to die. So in the four years of the Great Leap, before, between 1958 and 1961, nearly 40 million people died of starvation and overwork. <clears throat> Mao, of course, never got anywhere near his dream. And one reason was he was no good at running the economy. And for example, for all his military industries, he needed steel, and China didn't have enough steel mills. So Mao ordered the whole population to take part. Every organization in China had a steel quota. You know, do <clears throat> doctors, bus conductors, government officials, teachers, I and mean, everybody had to make steel. I was six then, but my major occupation was somehow to cook steel in the school kitchen. Now, of course, nothing like steel came out of these ventures, but mountains were stripped bare of trees to provide the fuel. Tens of millions of people were camping out in the mountains in the hope of finding iron ore. And the people, have, people sort of stay up 24 hours a day to man those backyard furnaces. And of course, this meant a lot of people died of in exhaustion with an empty stomach. Now, famine triggered off the biggest crisis in Mao's leadership. Um, I mean, even Mao's number two, um, President Liu Xiaoqi, who was a very hard man, you know, otherwise he wouldn't have risen to being Mao's number two, but he thought this was too much. So at the beginning of 1962, President Liu, together with 7,000 key party officials, um, you know, kind of launched the ambush against Mao, and together they managed to stop Mao's policies, which had led to tens of millions of deaths and which he didn't want to stop. And Mao was furious. He hated being outsmarted. He hated being throated. And he wanted revenge. And this was why he launched his Cultural Revolution in 1966, and in which President Liu was going to die a most appalling death. And the Cultural Revolution was Mao's great purge. And in, in the Cultural Revolution, also the regime unleashed a destruction of Chinese culture. Anything to do with the Chinese culture was deemed for destruction. Now, my father was one of the few who stood up to Mao and protested against the Cultural Revolution. As a result, he was arrested, tortured, 
driven insane. He was exiled to a camp and um, eventually died very tragically, prematurely. Um, my mother was under tremendous pressure to denounce my father. She refused. As a result, she was put over this over a hundred, those ghastly denunciation meetings, which were an everyday feature in China. Basically, the victims would be stood on the stage and their arms would be ferociously twisted to the back and their heads ferociously pushed down and they would be beaten and kicked and some beaten to death. My mother was made to kneel on broken glass. She was paraded in the streets where children spat at her and threw stones at her. Um, she was exiled to a camp but luckily, she survived. Today, she still lives in China.